Uh, my name's Ron Turner, I'm a uh, uh, Sparky over on the west coast in a small uh, town called Danthia. I've uh, been there my whole life, born and bred. And um, yeah, I'm over in Mackay picking up my new boat. Yeah, so this is my actual third plate boat. I fished for years, obviously out of a tinny. Um, and when I was in a position to, book, to buy my first boat, I ended up with a six and a half metre Shivers Meridian center cab. Um, and that was kind of opened up all avenues to get out to the Montes and Barrow and Rankin Bank and all these cool spots out from my hometown. I moved into a seven and a half metre Noble Super V, Aussie built Super V, one of the last Super Vs built in Australia. And then I got in a position where I could uh, probably afford, and it was a good time in my life to actually build my dream boat. So I, um, I pulled the trigger and here we are. So Spencer Boat, so I had, um, I probably had three years of research you know, that I just trawled the net, spoke to people, Facebook pages. I probably had my top five and, and Cole was in that list. Um, and yeah, when I, just when I rang him up and spoke to him, I just got that good vibe and I, I went for a burn in a mate's boat that was a, a Fisher, a 6.8 Fisher Center Cab and uh, I was just, yeah, I was super impressed with it. Super impressed that it, it punched hard for its size and um, yeah, I just, I, I love the design, I love the look of them and yeah. So it's an NQ Fisher uh, 750, so it's the, the first one off the cab for Svensson. Um, he had an 8 metre by 2.8, but yeah, I needed, I wanted that 7.5 by 2.7. So. Cole didn't actually have a, a 7.5 by 2.7, which is the dimensions of this, but actually um, in his fleet. So we had to draw that up and get it ar architecturally approved, which, which we did. And then um, he had his, his centre cab configuration, standard centre cab configuration. And to be honest, I think from the bow to the stern, I probably changed every layup that he did. And, and to his credit, mate, he was um, very accommodating and yeah, I definitely threw a spanner in the works and probably a few headaches for him. But um, yeah, the, the end product is um, everything I could have wished for. <laughs> Quick specs on the boat, 7.5 overall, um, 2.7 beam, uh, 750 litres of fuel split between two tanks. Uh, hull was rated for 500 horsepower, that's why we end up putting the twin 250s on it. Um, yeah, it's a weapon of a boat. So top speed, we trimmed it out yesterday with 600 litres of fuel and we got 48. So might gain a knot or two with, with a bit less fuel, but it uh, started chine, chine walking at 48, so we, uh, we backed her off there. I was probably open to build with any builder in Australia, to be honest, and I put the feelers out to a lot and got quotes back from a lot of guys. And, and for me, it was more the design of the Svensons, the hull, the hull design, uh, the flooding keel, the 23 degree dead rise, um, the welding, the pulse welding that the boys put into it. Um, and proven hulls, you know, Cole's been building, building these hulls for kind of 18 years now. Um, and yeah, he was really, really good to deal with on the phone. I just got that good vibe as soon as I spoke to him. He's really open to how customised I wanted the boat. And uh, yeah, he was on board. So um, I ended up going with Svensson. I'll start from the front of the boat. So uh, for me with the anchor well, um, I always, always up the front cast. And so I wanted that anchor well enclosed, you know, which we did. So we enclosed that. Also put a fighting cage up the front, so that drops into to four holes that um, when you take that cage out, they're just four 90 degree rod holders, you know, so you've got rod storage when you're up the front casting. And that sits inside the, um, the void just with pins, you can lock it in so you can get up there, casting it just kind of hugs around your hips. So you're up there nice and stable when you're casting. Um, no bow rails, had bow rails on my previous boat, but the type of fishing we do, like you're up there casting stick baits or poppers or whatever, you know, they just get in the way, so I clean them off. Also, when we're tournament fishing and you're up off that front deck, you need to be able to have that reach to get out to grab those leaders or whatever you need to do, fighting fish from the front. So, you know, without those bow rails, it, it's, it makes it a real clean um, slate and platform to fight a fish from. Moving down from the boat on the walk around, um, those walk around voids that come past the cavern, we, um, we actually dug into them and built nice big storage compartments. Uh, moving to the back of the boat, se a centered battery compartment, so all your electronics and everything are in a dry compartment there, stored. Um, either side we've got twin lightweight tanks on the back of the Portofinos. Uh, we've actually, you can see where it rolls down the edge there. Most, most boats have like a 45 degree. So we've built in the tuna tubes on either side of them. So we can pretty much have like four pitch baits now. I was initially going to be able to stand on the dash and go through the roof and that'll kind of meet you halfway mid bod and you can drive from there. And then there's a seat behind you that you can perk yourself up and drive. Um, but with the 19 inch Simrads, that didn't really go to plan. So what Cole made was a standing plank that just sits behind the dash that you put in and you can climb up through there, stand through, or you can actually sit up and just dangle your feet through and, and fish from there and, and uh, away you go. Moving into the cab from where, from where the driver's seat was, uh, we actually put fridge slides under both seats and we, um, 
those fridge slides sat back about 800 mil from the back seat so we extended the cabin to close them in so when the passengers sit behind there they've got protection uh, kill, a floodable kill tanks on the back of the boat we also concealed those fuel filters so they're out of the elements fuel lines aren't in the sun you can't actually see them you know those big fuel filters are pretty ugly hanging off the back of the boats there so we, we concealed them in there which is a really neat feature um, yeah twin 250 Susie APs that floodable keel at rest, we are fishing today in kind of that sloppy kind of 18 knot side on as we're casting and it was just rock solid, just sitting there like a champ. And Simrads, so all Simrads, they, um, they come aboard and, and help us out with, um, with fitting the boat out. It's been a great help, um, Dan and Laura. Um, so we end up putting twin 19 NSOs up on the dash that runs through our S5100 chirp module, which is feeding a CM559 chest mount high wire, high Wire, sorry, <laughs> a CM559 uh, high wide low, uh, three kilowatt on the low, two kilowatt on the high chirp transducer that we uh, chest mounted in a fairing block underneath the hull. Um, sit behind that, we got a SS175 one kilowatt uh, transducer sitting there as well. Uh, we end up putting a AP44 um, autopilot in it. Um, Susie gauges its interface with all the engine data. Uh, up on the top helm, we put our NSS Evo 2. Um, so when you're up there driving, you can also see what's going on. Stereo system, uh, we put a full JL system in it, um, running uh, four 7.7 .7 splits up in the cab on the rear bait station, a 6.5, a pair of 6.5 splits. So yeah, with the uh, electronics set up, it, it ended up coming to about 50 grand worth of electronics that we ended up putting in this. And um, obviously a Sparky by trade, I was pretty picky on how I wanted it fitted out. and. Um, Spoke through it with Kyle, we ended up getting um, schematics drawn up that he could follow to how I want it wired up and, um, and Kyle ran with the fit out and uh, yeah, when I went over the boat, I, I was actually very impressed. Yeah, he did a really, really great job and I, I did nitpick it and went all over it and I couldn't fault it. Yeah, he did a great job. When I heard the captain boys were going to come on in Mackay, I was a bit gutted that they couldn't actually come out of Carrasa and I couldn't take them out of my own turf. But um, yeah, so the boys met us at the ramp, five o'clock this morning, we launched the boat. Um, obviously not being a local here, it's my second day that I've ever fished here. Um, we ran out to one of the closer islands, the weather was a bit snotty in the morning. We got out of here and it kind of calmed off a little bit. We shot out and cast some stick baits around on a shoal and uh, got an old Spaniard, got a long tail and um, yeah, then we had this squall that was kind of on the horizon coming through and thought, oh, I might just pull into a beach to catch up with a few lads that were spearing at the time. So we pulled in and had some lunch and uh, yeah, about 15 minutes later, this 50 knot squall come through and just pumped us. Had a few greenies come over the bow and a couple of waves up over the windows and yeah, the boat just took it within its stride. So I'll, um, yeah, it was definitely a good way to test it, but not ideal. Yeah, so the old boy, he's lost his sea legs, you know, 40 years of fishing in a boat. He's, uh, he'd rather go and sit on a beach now or, or putt around a bay and, and just go blue bone fishing. But uh, the captain and boys wanted to put the boat through its paces. So we threw it into a few tight turns and he, uh, after about the third one, he said, that's an it, that's enough, I've had it. If you're doing any more of that, I'll jump on the other boat. But uh, nah, it, was good. it was good fun.